Mr. Bear. Um, I'm with Dr. Michelle McGill, Professor of French at North Carolina State University. And this morning we're going to discuss Proust. Vermeer was probably the mo one of the most important artists that he references. And I feel that what he was seeing, what, what Proust was seeing in his sort of cinematographer's mind, um, was trying to you know, in, in his own mind, as he was, as he was, as he was writing, I think he got a clarity like Vermeer, or I think that's what he was striving for, is that clarity of Vermeer. Mm -hmm. um, well, Vermeer certainly has a, a, a lot of uh, influence on, on uh, Proust, and uh, of course, he, he, he occupies a very important part of his uh, references to, to painting. Um, Proust had um, a talent, an extremely um, incredible talent for observation to detail and that may be what is annoying to some people when they try to read La Recherche at first. Uh, the, uh, the extreme attention to detail can, can seem at first very tedious. Um, but uh, that, that is, I think, his, his main talent and that's not only his observation to details in nature, in, in the daily uh, objects, um, and, and there, I think the uh, influence of Chardin was even stronger than one of uh -huh. Vermeer. But also in details of uh, people's um, reactions, what make them um, tick, what, what, you know, their hypocrisy, their, their body gestures. He was very, he was able, to the point where it could have been even a handicap for him, to, to see through uh, a lot of uh, the social uh, facade and, and mannerism. Mm -hmm. Cambrai at a distance, from a 20 mile radius, as we used to see it from the railway when we arrived there every year in Holy Week, was no more than a church epitomizing the town, representing it, speaking of it and for it to the horizon, and as one drew near, gathering close about its long, dark cloak sheltering from the wind on the open plain, as a shepherd gathers his sheep, the woolly grey backs of its flocking houses, which a fragment of its medieval ramparts enclosed here and there in an outline as scrupulously circular as that of a little town in a primitive painting. To live in, Cambrai was a trifle depressing, like its streets, whose houses, built of the blackened stone of the country, fronted with outside steps, capped with gables which projected long shadows downwards, were so dark that one had, as soon as the sun began to go down, to draw back the curtains in the sitting room windows. And these Cambrai streets exist in so remote a quarter of my memory, painted in colours so different from those in which the world is decked for me today, that in fact one and all of them, and the church which towered above them in the square, seem to me now more unsubstantial than the projections of my magic lantern. I think that Proust can be read by everybody. That's my point. How much of Proust can be read by everybody, that's a, that's a different story. Right. But I feel that you can actually open Proust at any page, read a few sentences, and take, you know, take advantage of it, benefit from it. Right. Um, I don't know another author like this where you can actually not read the whole thing. You can just, you know, take a little morsel and, and savor it. It's like no other book because as you read it, um, you're going through parts of your life long forgotten, mm -hmm. and you realize, as he says. Everything is within. Mm -hmm. um, all our treasures are within. And living them the first time, how he how he discusses his childhood, how he was unprepared, because not having the idea of what was to come, mm -hmm. not having the experience to understand, so he didn't have any perspective of what he was first seeing and how many things that he did see wrong. Everything was quite different mm -hmm. than what he thought it was, and. That is universal. Many people can relate to, to Proust because he has this way of, of uh, recapturing uh, the past, uh, not in a conscious way, but by uh, apprehending it and involuntarily through uh, involuntary, involuntary memory. Um, at the end of the book, it, it's true that he finally discovers what he's going to write about. 
it's like a revelation. What he's going to write about is his own life, uh, which he thought was very mediocre. Um, but if you remember in the first book in Combray, uh, when he's talking about his, his childhood, he said that, or I think it's on the first page actually, the, that every book he read, he would put himself in the shoes of the main character. So he could be a king, he could be a, a hero, he could be, you know, any character that was in the book. I think that he thinks that um, we all do that at any reading we do. And when he talks about homosexuality, for example, he says that, you know, we might be reading a um, Alexandre Dumas novel, and, you know, if you're an homosexual man, you might put yourself in the shoes of the main female character, but still, you still, you know, it identifies with the character. And I think he thinks that's true of every book. And also, it is definitely true of his own book. I found the whole path throbbing with the fragrance of hawthorn blossom. The hedge resembled a series of chapels whose walls were no longer visible under the mountains of flowers that were heaped upon their altars, while underneath the sun cast a square of light upon the ground as though it had shone in upon them through a window. The scent that swept out over me from them was as rich and as circumscribed in its range as though I had been standing before the lady altar and the flowers, themselves adorned also, held out each its little bunch of glittering stamens with an air of inattention, fine, radiating nerves in the flamboyant style of architecture, like those which in church framed the stair to the rood loft or closed the perpendicular tracery of the windows, but here spread out into pools of fleshy white, like strawberry beds in spring. My grandfather called me to him and, pointing to the hedge of Tonsonville, said, You're fond of hawthorns. Just look at this pink one. Isn't it pretty? And it was indeed a hawthorn, but one whose flowers were pink and lovelier even than the white. It too was in holiday attire, but it was attired even more richly than the rest, for the flowers which clung to its branches, one above another so thickly as to leave no part of the tree undecorated, like the tassels wreathed about the crook of a Rococo shepherdess, were every one of them in colour. It's the first time in words where we, we get a sense of what, um, what reality is really like in terms of you walk outside, you're smelling smoke, you're in another country where you smell that smoke, you're, you're seeing wind and you're from wind in another day, uh, you're, you're seeing uh, the sky, but the sky you're referencing it from a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, yeah, there are several several layers of of uh, of reality within reality. Several layers of space and several several layers of time within one moment. And he, he says that very very well. But I think that you're right. Uh, at the beginning of the century, there was the in um, psychology there was Freud. In philosophy, there was Bergson. And I think in literature there was Proust, which uh, who who uh, um, have marked the century so much that we don't have at all the same conception of time that we, we used to have. And of course, in science there was Einstein with the relativity of time. So so we I think that all the writers after that have been uh, apprehending the time in in a very different way. They have a time concept that was not possible to have in, in the nineteenth century. Uh, for Americans, I think that's that's true with Fitzgerald or Faulkner, for mm -hmm. example. But but for each individual and and for each person, um, I, I think that is uh, a description of how the 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 true memory, the memory not only of events but the feeling associated with the memory of the past is revealed by innocuous uh, sensations like like the taste of madeleine of course or or, or a smell of, of a flower or, or for him it, it can be uh, he, he talked about how we think we forget the dead and then one day we touch a glove and we burst into tears yes so it's 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 those sensations it's like the body was a uh, um, keeper of memories very well um, buried 
and then one thing happens like that and reveals it all. And then the memory, the, the conscious memory can take over and then we can write about it. Mm -hmm. But the, the catalyzer has to be that, that special moment. That yes. special he, he talks, moment. Of, again, he talks about the end, he can't go back to Baalbek, he can't go back to Venice, right. mm -hmm. he can only, and he can't talk to the people, he can't even go talk to the people to find the truth of the people. Mm -hmm. He has to go in his room Right. And find it within. Yeah. Well, he had apparently he had that, that ability or that disability right from the start when um, he used to he used to be a young uh, boy dreaming of going to Venice and dreaming to go, to going to Baalbek, and then when he got there, he was always disappointed because he because his, his, his fantasy was yeah, so much bigger. Of course, and and that's also true of, of uh, actually when he can appreciate by Beck is when he sees it through the eyes of an artist, S.T. Or a sw swan to begin with. Yeah, swan, swan or S.T. Or then, or then or start, yeah. And then he can appreciate it. Uh, and so it's it's like in, um, he's very much like his grandmother in a way because when he was a boy she used to send him postcards that themselves would depict uh, a work of art, so she was putting layers of art, you know, as much as she could on everything, and I think that he does that within his book. Um, so that 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 multiplies the the way to to look at reality as well. Is for example um, his way of always recognizing people he knows in. Uh, paintings in the uh, right saying there's only so many types right. and there are so many types of human uh, you know the character and and we can recognize in a painting from the 15th century we can recognize our neighbor for example right and, and that makes that makes um, that makes for a, a, a world that that we can relate to on the days when I did not go down to Madame de Guermantes to pass the time somehow during the hour that preceded the return of my mistress, I would take up an album of Elstir's work, one of Bergotte's books, Vinteuil's Sonata. Then, just as those works of art which seem to address themselves to the eye or ear alone require that, if we are to enjoy them, our awakened intelligence shall collaborate closely with those organs, I would unconsciously evoke from myself the dreams that Albertine had inspired in me long ago, before I knew her. Dreams that had been stifled by the routine of everyday life. I cast them into the composer's phrase or the painter's image as into a crucible, or used them to enrich the book that I was reading. And no doubt the book appeared all the more vivid in consequence. But Albertine herself profited just as much by being thus transported out of one of the two worlds to which we have access, and in which we can place alternately the same object, by escaping thus from the crushing weight of matter to play freely in the fluid space of mind. I found myself suddenly and for the instant capable of feeling an ardent desire for this irritating girl. She had at that moment the appearance of a work by Elstir or Bergotte. I felt a momentary enthusiasm for her, seeing her in the perspective of imagination and art. To live in this book um, was to see everything that my idea of luxury is. And not in terms of the aristocracy, but in terms of, of nature, in terms of art, in terms of to what's, to, what's open to everybody. The, the contradiction of the book is the people who who had the actual, you know, the, the wealth, mm -hmm. the, Did, the aristocracy, right. were, were absolutely miserable. Exactly. Uh, because, exactly. because they didn't know how because, to look. They, they, didn't, didn't, they didn't know how to look. Right. And, uh, uh, that, that's true. And I think that the, the reason that why Proust can touch uh, people, not only well-educated people, or, but anybody, is because his experience of, of life, of looking at life, is so... Uh, vivid uh, and the luxury is a luxury to to know how to take your time to know how to look at things uh, to know how to um, get lessons from even miserable experiences 
And, it, and it's interesting because he deals with these problems, like, like, like San Lu. He shows you the idealistic San, uh, San Lu, then he shows you the... The, the real San the, Lu. Then, the, well, the, and he talks about the, 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 the many layers of, right, of, of who right. people are. And but he sees these many layers in everybody, uh, whether they and, are and, physical and, and, or... And, and, and that is lifelike. Right, or psychological, uh, the, the passage on, on the, uh, watching um, Albertine while she's sleeping and all the different angles and how that, you know, the, the, this vision of Albertine is changed every second. He believes that w the, the, the human being is not one, it's made of very many different pieces that are ever-changing through every moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why memory is, is so um, fragmented, uh, because we are all in motion, we are all different people within one body at, at any time. And I think that's true of everybody. And it is, after all, as good a way as any of solving the problem of existence to approach near enough to the things that have appeared to us from a distance to be beautiful and mysterious, to be able to satisfy ourselves that they have neither mystery nor beauty. It is one of the systems of mental hygiene among which we are at liberty to choose our own, a system which is perhaps not to be recommended too strongly, but it gives us a certain tranquility with which to spend what remains of life and also, since it enables us to regret nothing, by assuring us that we have attained to the best, and that the best was nothing out of the common, with which to resign ourselves to death. Geographers, archaeologists may conduct us over Calypso's island, may excavate the palace of Minos, only Calypso becomes then nothing more than a woman, Minos than a king with no semblance of divinity. Even the good and bad qualities which history teaches us to have been the attributes of those quite real personages often differ widely from those which we had ascribed to the fabulous beings who bore the same names as they. Thus had there faded and vanished all the lovely mythology of ocean which I had composed in those first days. The supernatural creatures which for a little time there had been to me still introduced even without any intention on my part, a miraculous element into the most commonplace dealings that I might have with them, or rather prevented such dealings from ever becoming commonplace at all. You can open the book anywhere and you're always going to find something that is interesting to you. No matter, you know, if you're a doctor, you could read Proust. I mean, actually, there are several doctors uh, who Oh, wrote... he talks a lot about yeah, doctors. Yeah, he does. He, he, say, he says that... Uh, uh, it, it would be foolish to believe in uh, medicine, but it would be even more foolish not to believe mm -hmm. in, in it. You know, so I, I mean, you can you can see that on a number of levels. And what's funny is that um, in 2000, I was invited to um, to present something at the um, um, 2000 symposium on Proust, and there, of course, there were mostly Proustians people writing on, on Proust. But there were also lawyers and doctors and and people you know who have absolutely you would think who have absolutely no interest in post because they are not at all in literature. But um, I got the chance to talk to one of the, the French doctors there, and he said that um, he was surgeon during the Algerian War, and reading post was the only thing that could take him out of the horror of the war because. There you could see so much, so much beauty and and uh, compassion and uh, um, and um, learn from what you can get out of suffering, for example. How suffering shows you a different plane of, of reality. As Gilbert went into the other room, my surprise at her words and the pleasure they caused me was soon replaced by the idea of lost time which Mademoiselle saint Lou, in her way, had brought me without my even having seen her. Was she not like one of those star-shaped crossroads in a forest, where the paths coming from different directions converge, as they do in our lives? Those paths were numerous for me, which led to Mademoiselle de saint Lou and radiated around her. And above all, it was the two great ways where I had walked 
talked and dreamed so often, which came together in her, through her father, Robert de Saint-Lou, the Guermantes way, through Gilberte, her mother, the Méséglise way, which was Swann's way. One of them, the Méséglise way, led me by way of the young girl's mother to Swann and to my evenings in Combray. The other, by way of her father, to my afternoons at Balbec, where I pictured him against the dazzling sea. And between these two paths led transversal ones. My presence in the real Balbec, where I had known saint Lou, was to a great extent due to what Swann had told me about the churches, and especially the Persian church, which had made me want so much to go there. And again, through Robert de saint Lou, who was the nephew of the Duchesse de Guermantes, I was led back once more to Combray, to the Guermantes way. The great thing about this is you, you, you go through a whole life, mm -hmm. which, which you literally, he was writing up to the last day, so right. he, he, you really have a sense. You, you go through the war with these people, you go through childhood with these people, to the end when he's singing the, the Star Road, uh, uh, Mademoiselle Saint Lou, mm -hmm. where the, the starry path of all the, how do you, how do you describe that, a, like a star of crossroads in the, in the forest meeting in this, in this one girl mm -hmm. at, the, mm -hmm. at the end, yes. where you saw the best of, of everything, where right. it was all leading. Uh, all, uh, yes, and, and if you've lived long enough to see your friends uh, grow up, see your friends have kids, see friends die, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's so very lifelike. So y you have these, uh, um, these ups and downs, which are very much like life, and that's why everybody can relate. What, what am I missing in French? <laughs> um, hmm, this, this, is a very, uh, this is a question we could talk about for one semester. <laughs> Style of Proust. Tons of books have been written about that. It, it's really hard to narrow it down. As far as translation, um, right now I'm, I'm teaching translation. Uh -huh. And um, once in a while, uh, or at the end of the semester, I like to try to translate, to have my students translate one sentence. Now, one sentence of Proust can be four meters long. Right, of course. It can go around and around yeah. forever. Yeah. Uh, it can be a, you know, three, four paragraphs and so on. Um, but even a small sentence of Proust is very hard to translate. Even the title. No, but I mean, the, the, the know, title means a different thing. Remember, right. things pass into something very different in, than in Search of Lost Time. It's beautiful. It's taken from a sonnet uh, by Shakespeare, and right. it's beautiful and poetic. But it's but not it, what the it, book is about. It doesn't. It doesn't say what the book is about right. at all. It, it doesn't. In Search of Lost Time is it's very. It's sort of betrays. It, 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 in Search of Lost Time is a very specific right. meaning. And when you know that in French, perdu means both lost and wasted. Uh -huh. You know, so so you you never yeah, really see. find one word in English that that means both lost and wasted. I mean, yeah. do you know one? I don't no. know. One. See, so these are subtleties. So that, right from the very beginning, yeah. you from, from the title itself, you're missing what one one aspect. Have, have you read the book in English? I've read some parts. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Is is it a very different experience? Yes, very different. For me. Um, um, bilingualism is, is a unique experience itself. Uh, so, uh, reading in French, uh, which is my native tongue, um, it's, it's, I don't have to make any effort for, for the words to speak to me in several dimensions. I see them not only the way they are written. For me, for example, uh, E with an accent aigu and the E with an accent grave are two different figures. They, they, they have a very different effect on me, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, uh, and and the way they will sound um, rings different things. Uh, but in English, it's like a post, but a flat post, a, a, a post with a unilevel. Without, uh, without the, because I, I know he is so conscious of the sound of words. Right. He, he's so conscious yes. of. Yes, and, and the thing you can do is just read a sentence by post allowed and you will see all the uh, alliterations and and the, the the rhythm of the sentence and but if you do that in english i mean in english you have in every translation you have to make a choice are you going to really 
try to um, translate the content very, very faithfully? Or are you trying to make it to make a work of art another work of art, like Baudelaire did for Poe? In other words, translating Proust is probably the, the most difficult thing that anybody can can try to do, uh, because um, the style of Proust is so much uh, it's so much it's so important within the work.